Check, check. Oh, that works. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is the Reverend Mitchell Felton with us today. <laughs> okay, how, how are we now? No? Oh, great. I just use the handheld. Perfect. Oh, Very good. there we go. Now we're clicking. Okay. <laughs> well, hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Father Mitchell. I have the privilege and pleasure of leading our forum today. Uh, I'm actually just going to use the handheld to make sure we're playing it safe. Okay. Let's begin in prayer. The Lord be with you. Holy, mighty, and living God, thank you for this day, and thank you... Uh, for the season of year W. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for the women in Scripture, for those who proclaim resurrection first. Lord, we give you thanks for all of the women and the folks who are gender nonconforming, the folks who are trans, who live your love in this world. Might we be a people who honor them, who um, can sense the need to be led by them, uh, as we journey towards the cross. Uh, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So um, I'm going to go ahead and sit down. Um, I'm super excited about this. I love poetry, and I love these people who are joining me to lead this forum. Um, the way that the forum will work is uh, we'll do introductions, I'll ask them two questions about joy and their experience of uh, what it means to be uh, embodied. Uh, I'll ask them a little bit about scripture, and then we'll get into poetry. So I will let Katie introduce herself. Um, hi, my name is Katie Spiro. I'm a postulant from the Diocese of Chicago. Um, I go to VTS. I was a student with Mitchell. Uh, my greatest honor. And um, my undergraduate uh, studies was uh, in poetry and creative writing. So I'm very excited for this forum. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Maria Teresa. I am a senior, also at Virginia Theological Seminary. I am a candidate for holy orders as well from the Diocese of Texas. Uh, what else? I'm Afro-Latina and no background in poetry, but love it. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Jessica Anderson. I started at Virginia Theological Seminary and I'm finishing in May at Howard University Divinity School. Um, and I also work during the day as somebody who trains activists, water protectors, uh, progressive folks, folks who are trying to fight for a liberated world. Uh, and at night, I'm at Howard doing school, which is down the street, now that I know. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So first question, here we go, surprise. <laughs> Surprise, <laughs> the old mic out of the... Um, I'm curious uh, for myself and for all who are here, what uh, brings you joy uh, as a woman and uh, given your social location in the world? What are things that bring you joy? Um, as a new mom, uh, my, my daughter's over there, she's nine months. All of that has just transformed my understanding of what it means for me to be a woman, um, a Latina woman, an Afro-Latina woman. Um, it has completely transformed my relationship with God, my spirituality, my relationship with others. Um, that has to be my biggest way of embodying womanhood right now, just completely being um, in love with this new stage of being a mom. But also as Latina, it's just I, I, I find joy within people. I find joy being here with you all. I find joy in laughter. I find joy in dancing and talking to my hands. And um, I just, I find that the way that we get through so many things, especially within my culture, is through this immense amount of joy that we embody. Um, my dad reminded me that we have this big theology of tomorrow. Tomorrow everything will be better. Tomorrow things will be a little easier. Today may suck, but tomorrow, just tomorrow, right? Hold on to tomorrow. So I think that's, I think I, I do a pretty good job of embodying that I could be having the roughest day, but something about knowing that tomorrow will be easier um, just brings me a lot of peace, love, and, and absolute joy. I'm very excited and joyful all the time about having access to God. 
through my womanness, that I think if we find that God can be embodied in a woman's body, then I feel really excited all of the time and joyful that I get access to that in a particular way. And I think as a black woman, there are just many distinct things um, that oppression didn't have to teach me, that like black people are not just what they are because of oppression, they are what they are because of their creation. And so I'm really excited about seeing the little girls in my church spin around so I could see their braids. <laughs> I'm very excited about what it means to have dark skin and how that makes me an artifact of ancestors who were dark like me. And so there are so many parts of being a woman that I just find joyful because I know that in some way in God's design, that was all intentional. Um, and that's something to celebrate and to make sacred and that if we are all made in the image of God, then part of that image is just as I am, and that makes me very joyful. <laughs> what a privilege. <laughs> um, so, well, so I had to start, so my mom is here today. It's very exciting. Um, and uh, one of the great gifts that my mother and my father gave me is um, that I am ethnically Jewish. And so as a Jewish Christian, uh, my social location has a lot of intersectionality that is um, complicated but uh, brings me immense, immense joy. And um, I look at my mom because she reminds me of what's joyful about being in this body. Um, we experience it so much through laughter and often laughter through periods of extreme pain and fear. And so it's amazing to see uh, the trials and tribulations of life transformed within the body into laughter. Um, that and food, you know, we like to eat. So um, I experience a lot of joy through that. <laughs> and I will say I'm also um, a cancer survivor. And so that has really transformed my relationship with my body in a lot of very difficult ways that I'm still integrating. Um, and joy becomes something that I have to intentionally learn again every single day. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. Right. No, you got a mic. I it's got fine. a mic. I got a mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we move to poetry, I am curious um, which stories or women in the Bible um, most, do you most relate to or um, are your favorite or stick out for you? Um, um, I was just talking earlier that in, in preparing for this, I completely forgot there's a whole other testament. So I'm sorry if both of my uh, sheroes come from the, uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. But for me, especially Hagar and Ruth, um, those, I find Hagar's bravery, courageousness, um, incredibly pioneering and trailblazing in, in a time where she was just absolutely not well treated. Um, uh, her uh, way of being able to still, as somebody who is considered foreign, um, still be able to, to connect with God in a way that was so meaningful in probably her scariest time, right? You think your baby's about to die and you're just like, I can't even look, it's how horrible it is. And then for God to still find you in those moments, it's just a great reminder to me, it's like I was saying similar before, that things will get better. In the darkest and hardest of spots, there you will find God. Um, and Ruth, I mean, she is the best guide for anyone who has a mother-in-law, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, if you're watching mother-in-law, I love you. Um, but truly, she, she is also foreign. I think I, I really uh, gravitate to women that are strangers in, in, in different lands. Um, but she, she shows us what it means to stick by somebody in their bitterness, in their grieving, in their meanness and, and just what it truly means to stick with somebody in good and in the bad and in the ugly. And I think that is something so hard to do, especially nowadays when so many things are dividing us. But to have Ruth in a way that continues to tell us, wherever you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Um, it's just a constant reminder to me to be and walk alongside others like that. Um. So, plus one <laughs> to that. Um, I think uh, Hagar, Hagar, uh, 
and Martha tend to be the two that I love. I love a woman who's willing to contend with God, um, that's willing to yell at God and say, you should have been here. Um, and God's response to that is a resurrection. And so I think that the, that the power of women showing up in the text and being willing to say that something's not right about what I see and to not passively accept that and to call Jesus into himself <laughs> and say, you could be holier than this. You waited three days and now he stinks. Like, I wanna be the kind of woman who has an honest relationship with God that can do that. Um, and to think about Hagar as an enslaved woman getting to engage in the theological talk with God and say, this is who I name you, and God to let that be. And for me in this time, being able to have the ability to name God and to say how I see God and how I experience God and for that to be legitimate, in a time when she couldn't name herself because Hagar really means foreigner or fugitive. It's not a name she gave herself. I'm sure her mama didn't name her fugitive <laughs> or foreigner. Uh, and so and for her not to be able to name herself but then get to name God uh, is a great privilege to see what happens when God sees black women and God, in return, we get to see God back. And so I think that those two I love because of their own ability to free themselves and for Hagar to take her body uh, and free it and to bring her ch unborn child as contraband is a powerful thing to think about what somebody can do to free themselves and others. And for black women now to test whether or not what we want to believe in that, that story is sacred <laughs> and for us to think about what it does it mean for God to say go back to a place where somebody was trying to kill you that whole language is violent and so she wasn't going back to somebody who was just mean she was going back to somebody who was trying to kill her yeah. and to think about what it means for us to free ourselves and to bring our children into freedom and for that book to sit in the center of the patriarch story just the chiasm just the 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 what the Hebrew Bible was trying to offer us is pay attention to what you do to black women. Mm. Pay attention to how ugly enslave, enslavement gets. Like, pay attention to what it means to be a surrogate in the middle of a patriarch story. All of that is important to me. So those two, people who yell at God, I, I can relate to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you for that, both of you. And. Yes, let's like check up with the Ruth. I mean, it's, uh, both of my grandmothers were named Ruth, um, and I just feel that um, the sacredness of that um, lineage. Uh, and um, also, <laughs> this is such a cop out, but I was telling you before, I wanna say every woman in the Bible is my favorite woman in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, because if you think about the incredible odds and the sacrifices and the suffering that every single one of those women was living through and with and at the same time experiencing God acting through them with their consent through just an unimaginable um, weight of patriarchy uh, that was oppressing them all throughout God's attempts to work in the world through their bodies. And um, so it inspires me and it uh, humbles me. And it kind of makes me feel like, okay, I can feel like I'm nothing. That's an okay feeling. That doesn't mean that God's not gonna do his will on the earth through my body. And so that gives me some courage and some strength. Um, and also just Jacobed, uh, the sacrifice that she made um, for Moses and for Miriam and Aaron, for her children. Um, and also that we don't even hear her name in the beginning when she's doing the most amazing thing of putting Moses in the water. And, uh, and the songs of the women, the songs that we get from Miriam and the song we get from Hannah, uh, echoed again through Mary. Um, songs and poetry like we're about to hear are something that uh, it's like to me a zip file like it seems like just one file on your computer you open it and there's just a million other things in there that it, all you had to do was click for you to find and I feel like the songs are like that still today they're echoing to us much more than we uh, know that they contain until we give them a chance to just work on us 
be time. Oh I know, goodness. I know. It's hard. It's, it's powerful, though. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, I would love for us to move into uh, the poems. So this first poem is by, um, actually, I should click it. Caught there. Um, so the first poem will be by Crystal Valentine. The title of it is, And the News Reporter Says Jesus is White. This was the poem that I opened uh, my sermon with to begin uh, the season of year W. Um, and um, what we'll do is we'll watch the poem, we'll reflect, and then we'll offer you a chance to reflect with us as well. And the news reporter says, Jesus is white. She says it with a smile on her face, like it's the most obvious thing in the world. So sure of herself, of her privilege, her ability to change history, rewrite bodies to make them look like her. She says it the same way politicians say racism no longer exists. The same way police officers call dead black boys thugs. The same way white gentrifiers call Brooklyn home. She says it with an American accent, her voice doing that American thing, crawling out of her throat, reaching to clasp onto something that does not belong to her. And I laugh to myself. What makes a black man a black man? Is it a white woman's confirmation? Is it her head nod? Is it the way she's allowed to go on national television and all correct the Bible and God himself tell him who his son really was? What makes a black man a black man? Is it the way reporters retell their deaths like fairy tales? Is it the way they cannot outrun a bullet? How can she say Jesus was a white man when he died the blackest way possible? With his hands up with his mother watching, crying at his feet, her tears, nothing more than gossip for the news reporters or prophets to document, with his body left to sour in the sun, with his human stripped from his black, remember that? How the whole world was saved by a black man, by a man so loved by God, he called him Ken, called him black, now ain't that suspicious? Ain't that newsworthy? Ain't that something worth being killed over? I, I uh, will probably be on the uh, unpopular side of saying that this is, I've, he I've heard comrades say this as well, that, that Jesus died in the blackest way possible. And I don't think that God created us to die at the hands of the state. And so I don't think it's the blackest way possible. I think it's the white, most white supremacist way possible. And why, what I mean by white supremacist is not individual white people, but a system of disembodying people that doesn't work for white people as well. And so when I uh, listen to that, I do hear that the privilege to name that black people often don't get over themselves to be able to name who they are and what their experience is and what their reflections on God are and how much we're sy systemically pushed out of the ability to name things. And so we are always named or overdetermined by our oppressors. And so I think it's, uh, it, language matters to me. And so when you think about dying in a black way, I hope that is peacefully at an old age. <laughs> I do not hope that that is uh, at the cross or on a lynching tree or at the hands of the state or eight minutes with a police officer's knee on my neck. Like, that is not a black way to die for me. Um, I think that's the way to die when we've been woefully sinful. And so when I think about our privilege to name who people are, um, particularly uh, when we know, when we have you know, when we have our, our sacred texts that tell us that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and we know where Bethlehem is, 
and that Jesus, we know that Bethlehem is in Palestine, right? Like these things, just to be able to say <laughs> casually <laughs> that Jesus is white um, gives us a great error already for people to be able to tell their own stories inside of the context that makes sense. And so I appreciate this poem for its ability to help to push us to see what could be possible if I let people name themselves, if I let them name their own lives and their own experience without having to name them first. And what privilege do I have to name what is and what isn't? And then to stop and ask myself, like, how, how would we like black people to die? And does our history have to be full of dying in the most violent, uh, sinful, uh, harmful ways possible that I don't want to teach, I don't have children, but I don't want to teach them that the way that you should die is, is at the hands of the state. And so I appreciate the, the poem for giving us a chance to pause and reflect on what that means for us um, and what we get to do as people by refusing to name by saying Jesus is what Jesus claimed to be. <laughs> and black people are what black people claim to be. And women are what they claim to be. And queer people are what they claim to be. That we lose people <laughs> to be able to do their own naming and then to honor the naming that that is. And we see that all through creation, that creation gives uh, Adam the chance to name. And you don't see God being like, you sure you want to call that an octopus? <laughs> Right, like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but if that was the name that, that, <laughs> that Adam wanted to give, then we see God gives us an honoring of naming and renaming. And I think what I'm seeing in this church and what I've seen in sitting through the service this morning is that you all are honoring the ability to rename and to use the year of the W and to come back into something and to see what it would mean to try again with a different name and who gets free doing that. So thank you. Um, this was an incredibly emotional poem for me to hear. Even now, I just, uh, I welted up again. I think the emotion that she carries while, um, throughout the whole uh, poem is just incredibly intense. Um, since we were in Psalms class, Psalm 13 is just something that's been so heavy on my heart. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? And that, and, and hearing it again, that's all I hear. You know, how long, O oh Lord, will we continue to hear these things on the news? How long, O oh Lord, will these black bodies continue to be misnamed? How long, O oh Lord, will we continue to believe the lies that the system continues to put on us? And I'm sitting with that, how long, oh Lord? I'm sitting with, um, as an Afro-Latina woman that is daughter of immigrants, how am I sitting with what the new um, keeps telling me that I'm supposed to be, that I'm supposed to speak? When she said, doing that American thing, I'm like, how many times have I wanted to be able to speak in that American way? Or how many times have I been told, you sound different today? Um, why do you, why, how, why did you read the Psalm that way? You know, your tone was, without them saying that American way that you usually don't speak in. So this, this arose in me so many of the things, the stereotypes, the, the, the ways of being that is considered appropriate or well, or the, the, perf the perfection in order to be American, in order to be worthy, in order, in order to be enough. And I think, especially what Jessica keeps bringing us back to, that we don't need any of that because God has already told us that we are worthy, that we are enough in our blackness, in our Latinaness, in, in our womanness, in whatever we are, we are already enough. Um, and still, I am holding that intention with how long, oh Lord? Um, how can we continue to courageously walk into who we are meant to be, who we are already created to be, while also dealing with these constant news cycles coming in, reminding us of another body, of another family, of another human being that's life completely has been ignored, um, just for looking different, speaking differently. Um, so I, I'm still sitting with uh, that main question, how long, oh Lord? Yeah, thank you for that, um, and and thank you, Jessica, um, because I hadn't thought about it that way uh, until you said that. And one of the things I'm grateful for about this artist um, and uh, her sacrifice of creativity that she's given us is um, the uh, 
the dialogic nature of poetry. You know, it's a conversation. It isn't, you're not getting something right or wrong about a poem. You know, the point is to let it in and see how it interacts with your stuff inside because then you get to learn something about yourself, your kind of assumed theologies, assumed beliefs, or conscious beliefs and theologies that you've got going on. And you can see how uh, that might transform you because poetry is transformative. It's like the way we use language to try to communicate with each other just in a common day-to-day -day basis is, um, a, as we know, fraught and difficult. We have trouble communicating, but because poetry isn't about uh, communicating something right or wrongly, but about communicating something deeply and truthfully and soulfully, then we can just allow it to come in and work on us and change us over time. And so it's kind of, to me, it's a hallowing and it's sort of God's resurrection thing that he does because she's talking about a completely irreverent, painful, a uh, racist experience of this newscaster completely debasing humanity with her words. She's taking a bad situation and because of her own sacrifice of creativity is letting God resurrect it and transform it into something that can change us and teach us and allow our souls to breathe a little bit more freely. So um, that's one of the things I love that we'll see again in the next poem. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, we are now going to open it up for your um, experience of the poem. Um, so friendly reminder, uh, we did not write the poem. We did not perform it. So there are no questions for us. So what could be really helpful is thinking about framing it of my experience with this poem is um, one thing I am curious about with this poem is um, one thing that this poem has done in me is, um, so thinking about using I statements, um, but there are really right now no questions for us, but we would love to hear about your experience of it. So I am going to take this mic. If you don't mind just placing it in there, that'd be great. And just at any point, um, please come share. Oh, I didn't hear that part. When I, when I heard this more, when I heard Mitchell's first sermon, there was a couple thoughts that came into my mind. The first was, you know, the reporter says, and I say, who, who says this? So my, I just Google, you know, God, Jesus is white or Jesus is not white. So that was informative to say who, who says it. it it's essentially all, all stories about how people say Jesus, saying Jesus is right, white is not right. Like, I couldn't find anybody that said Jesus is white. That was kind of one story of like, oh, what are really people thinking? The other thought that came into mind is it just feels a little too, um, like, too much power. Uh, I feel like Jesus should be able to self-identify. I don't know, maybe this is the modern me. It's like, when people ask me, like, oh, you know, what are the races of your friends? I'm like, I'm not really sure. I don't know how they all self-identify. Uh, especially like the census says if you're Egyptian or Palestinian, you're white. But a lot of Egyptians and Palestinians might not feel that they're white. Like they say, if you're Persians, they say you're white. But like my Persian friends are thinking, no, we're not white, we're brown people. So that was the other thing that popped into my mind is are we kind of overstepping our bounds by saying Jesus is white or not white? Is that really Jesus' call and not our call? Thank you. The question that this raised in my mind was, is skin color an attribute of Jesus at all? Or 
is he different color by whosoever looks at him. In his entourage, it's plausible that there was <clears throat> defined skin color. Pilate, for example, came from Rome, so he was probably lighter color than most of the people in Palestine. Um, the man from Cyrenaica who crossed the, uh, the way to Golgotha and was press ganged into carrying Jesus' cross, plausibly was darker because he came from Africa. But uh, if Jesus had some skin color, does the resurrected Christ necessarily have any skin color? Or is that something that um, the resurrection elevated him and us above skin colors? That is my question. Excellent, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, yesterday I heard Paul Lynch speak, who is the recent Booker Prize winner, and he talked about this idea that really good writing is trying, to, or you know, any good text is trying to get to um, deep symbolism that is almost impossible to put into words. And I was wondering what you all thought about the <clears throat> the intense symbolism that's in that poem and that uh, the interchange between words and what we're able to express, and that symbolism. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We'll move into our next uh, poem, which is by uh, actually Crystal's girlfriend, Portia. Uh, Portia's poem is titled Rakia Boyd. Rakia Boyd was uh, an unarmed black woman who uh, was murdered at the hands of the state. And so we will move into that poem now. Last night, no one showed up to march for Rakia Boyd. Rakia was shot dead in the head by cops in Chicago on Monday. A Cook County judge acquitted police of killing Rakia. Dante Servin, charged of manslaughter, went jailbird free. Rakia Boyd was a 22-year-old unarmed black woman living on the south side of Chicago, and last night, no one showed up to march at her rally. I guess all the protesters got tied up. I guess all the black folks were busy making signs saying, stop killing our black boys, I guess. No one hears the howling of a black girl ghost in the nighttime. We stay unheard, blotted out, buried, dead. Black girls receive tombstones too soon and never any flowers to dress the grave, so we fight alone. They will tell you the woes of a black man who got beat by the police in the street, beat by the man at work, beat by the system at the institution, but never of the black woman he took his frustration out on, never, never of the black girl he stretched into a casket. They will tell you of the brown boys who get pushed from school through pipeline to prison, but never of the girls who fill the cells, never of the orange jumpsuits they camouflage 
montage into 200 black girls go missing in Nigeria and America puts out a hashtag instead of a search party. No one ever causes a riot. The first black first lady is being called the first ape on all of the media outlets and no one is outraged. There ain't no boycott or nothing down the street. A man did a hate speech to a black butch woman and someone gave it a 10. Someone said it was freedom. Poets are still over there cheering. I guess queer black woman ain't black enough. I guess the movement ain't meant to be a crossroad. I guess we are here for play, pretend, make believe, poof. How magic trick missing must I become? How tight does my noose have to ring? How long does my body need to deteriorate before anyone can smell it rot? If a black boy gets shot by the cops, isn't that a tragedy? Ain't it the blues? Isn't it a misfortune if a black girl gets killed by police and the killer goes free? Does anyone notice? Do you still call it a lynching? Is her rally just a rehearsal? shows up. Um, I just want to say that when I when we first watched this, uh, my immediate reaction was to be speechless and that that is a perfectly acceptable response to poetry and to the depth and uh, sacredness of what she's offering us in that poem. Um, if your mind is rendered speechless when you hear a poem, that creates space for the Holy Spirit to teach something new. Um, uh, for you to think thoughts you've never thought before, experience feelings you've never felt before. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about using language in this way. Every time she made a B sound, B, it's like I could feel the poem getting deeper and deeper into my body. And um, that is, it, that's an embodied experience of meaning. Um, oftentimes when meaning rises or only gets through the first layer of mind, um, all we get is that first layer of chatter that we're all so used to. Um, but the way that she honored Rakia by immortalizing that experience, not just her death, but uh, who she is meant to be as a sacred child of God in all of our lives. And that I'm still haunted by the, um, is the, the rally just a rehearsal? Because, um, and it's, it's kind of like this ghost that's been with me ever since then. And I think to allow that to happen, to allow something to haunt you that a poet has said, is um, an opportunity for something new to occur within you, um, for your heart to change. Uh. Um, I'm being reminded of when one of George Floyd's last words was mama, and it says that it rang a bell to all the mamas throughout the whole country, throughout the whole world, the fact that he called out for his mom. Even if you weren't, a mom, I wasn't a mom at that time, you felt like something ignited in you. And still, even when last words are for a woman, even when last words are for moms, we are constantly just not put as a priority. We're constantly just exactly as this poem is saying, we are constantly being left alone um, in marches that need to be in honor of our experiences, in honor of our own abuse, in honor of our own neglect, there, it feels like it's a rehearsal. Um, when we look at the fact that Mary Magdalene is the first apostle, but we don't really teach that in churches, what is that saying? Is that still, still a rehearsal, right? Are we still just waiting for when Peter gets to be the first apostle? 
where is it? This poem has just ignited in me, I will be honest, anger. Anger at the fact that nothing, I don't know when it came out, 2015, nothing has changed in almost 10 years um, in my experience. Seminaries are still mostly filled with men. Um, when we go for ashes to go and they see me, they ask for a male priest. Um, there is still constantly this idea that women, black women, Latina women, non-binary, trans women are of a lesser status and therefore our voices somehow continue to be muted and continue to be denied of sacred spaces in churches, in schools, in establishments, in institutions. Um, so I feel the anger in all of this and I kept hearing mama um, and I kept, I'm getting emotional, I kept hearing mama in the sense that in Jesus, the women that stayed were women. Women constantly are the ones that are staying. Women are constantly the ones that we call out for. I'm thinking about when I was in birth, I just called out my mom, even though she was right next to me. When we were in pain, usually mom. And yet our bodies are ignored the moment that we need somebody by our side to advocate for our needs and our voices. And so I'm sitting with the tension of how is it that we are the first to show up and yet the least to be shown up for. Um, in my Genesis course, my job was to do some exegesis for some stories. Um, and I started with Cain and Abel, because why not? And um, one of the things I wanted to argue in my exegesis is that the blood crying out from the ground is the first protest. That when somebody dies, creation has a problem with that when somebody dies unjustly. And so to hear nobody showed up as somebody who, I, who organizes and does direct action, it means something if nobody shows up for your action. It means nobody cares that you have been treated unjustly. And so it is such a deep shame uh, for a black woman to die and nobody show up. And so the value of the year of the W is to ask ourselves, who have we not shown up for in our text? That for generation after generation, we have not shown up for Shifra and Pua, the midwives. We have not showed up for Miriam, the sister. We have not showed up or even asked questions about why a woman would want a daughter, or would want a son. Why Pharaoh's daughter would want a son in the first place. We have not asked any questions, any stories. Was she, and do we know she was, uh, had fertility issues? <laughs> do we know why she wanted a child, right? Like we don't ask any questions. Nobody is showing up in our text for the women. And so your endeavor with the year of the W makes me so proud to see that maybe for the first time there might be a church at the protest. <laughs> A church that says that the women that are in our text, named or unnamed, actually do matter and are part of the way that God shows us who God is by showing us who the women are. And so I think that the, this kind of poem reminds us that there is a responsibility to keep showing up. There is a responsibility to wake up and see the things that you have not seen and ask questions, why have I not seen that before? That there are so many texts that we look at again with fresh eyes and we say, that happened? Like that? How did I miss it? And so I think Rakia Boy, in Rakia Boyd's honor, then we have to call all the names. Uh, that we have to name the women that are in the Bible or find the names of the women they represent and to do something with that and to ask ourselves what do we want to be inside of that and what is that supposed to be teaching us? That uh, you keep inviting us to think about poetry, that most of our Bible is that. That is the genre of much of our Bible is poetry. And so we have to ask ourselves what can we do with that genre inside of our Bible, our Psalms, our Proverbs, our books of wisdom, right? Our wisdom literature, all of that, poetry, and uh, what that poetry might be saying in relationship and in conversation with the poem we're hearing now that I think would make us uh, so much more righteous and so much more just and so much more faithful to our texts if they were to include the women. <laughs> That if we just didn't skip over them every single time and imagine that they had nothing to offer, which I think is an untruth. And it makes us learn only, be, only how to be partway faithful because we have to learn from the witness and the testimony of the women who, like you said, were the ones who decided to show up at the cross 
And so in my church, in their tradition, they only let women uh, preach Good Friday because they were the only ones that came. <laughs> and so we think about how many people were missing and who decided to come and watch the violence and who were the ones who had to sit through it and who were the ones who had to go and make sure that the burial was proper and the ones that had to go and ask the gardener, where have you laid him? That women have good questions and have good eyewitness testimony. And I think that this, uh, this poem keeps reminding us to stay faithful, to not skip over the women in the Bible, but to see them and to figure out how to be faithful to them and show up. Sisters at the cross. <laughs> One of the real gifts of silence uh, is that it might feel awkward and yet God is speaking through the silence and that's great so one of the other gifts is to recognize that we don't have to put our voice where God is speaking Again, we did not write the poem. We did not perform it. I do offer a chance if you would like to share your experience of the poem about Rakia Boyd. Thank you all. Um, a favorite priest of mine from here uh, told me one time that if you allow yourself to be in your body and you feel tingly all over, that it might be the Holy Spirit inviting you to something. So that poem was very tingly. And that's all. Jessica, what time do we have? What time do we have? 11. Uh, final question for you all, and thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, given your bodies, what makes you feel free? Jesus. <laughs> Next question. Uh, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no really, I, I do. I feel, listen, when I come to Jesus, I don't have to be anybody. I don't have to think about who I am. I don't have to know anything about myself. I just am who I am, and that is freedom to me. Uh, not having to be anybody in particular and just experiencing the quality that is the life that I am. And I feel that in Christ. 
I find a lot of freedom in my body, but because I see it in the Holy Scriptures, I see experiences of anger, experiences of pregnancy, pregnancy loss. I, I see experience of hardships. I see experience of loneliness. I see experience of battling and wrestling with who God is in my life. And when I see that in the Holy Scriptures, it gives me permission to just dwell in the fact that in my body, whatever I feel, the good and the bad, it has all been done before, and God is still deemed it loved and worthy, um, and I can be free in that. Um, for me, freedom is the agency. When you're oppressed, so much of your embodiment is micromanaged. How you talk, what you do with your hair, what you wear, where you go to work, where, how your accent sounds, all of that is micromanaged every day. My embodiment is micromanaged and forgotten about and put it to the side and I go to the store and they don't have, they don't have a color that matches my foundation. All the foolishness, right? All of the foolishness. And I think what makes me feel free is agency. That's why I love in full circle Hagar's ability to say, you are the God who sees me. And to be able to say who that God is and to recognize that that God is in full view of who I am. <laughs> no matter what generation chooses to not see me, right? God has said in that moment to an enslaved Egyptian woman that she is seen. <laughs> and just to be able to have the agency to choose for myself <laughs> what freedom could be and what I could do and what God might see and who God gets to be for me, I think is the ultimate sense of freedom that we get to choose and that, that choosing, right, is not uh, regulated by the power around us. And we're all so much more free <laughs> when we get to choose. This is not a freedom just for me, and it's the womanist ethic is that we choose things that uh, make everyone free. We don't choose things with an agenda to get only black women free, but if black women, our freedom, adds to the freedom of everybody else. And so that is what makes me most free, is the ability to choose, because in so doing, so does everybody else in this room. Y'all are amazing. <laughs> um, this will conclude our time together. Um, any questions, or as Jessica said, foolishness? <laughs> that you might have, uh, bring it to me and Reverend Adeline. Uh, let them be free, please. So, um, if you will, uh, will you please put your hands together again for Katie, Maria Teresa, and Jessica. Um, let us pray. Gracious, holy, and living God, we give you thanks that it was women at the tomb who proclaimed your resurrection and who ran to tell all of the world. Gracious Lord, we now bearing the gift and holiness of your resurrection now follow their lead to proclaim that you are making all things new. Amen. Thank you all.